Um, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome and introduce today's speaker, Eric Kaiser. Um, so Eric got his PhD uh, in 2012 from Harvard University, uh, working with Miyake Ishii. Uh, he then went on to Rice University and did a postdoc, and then joined the faculty here at the University of Arizona in 2016, um, along with myself. So uh, one facet of Eric's work is uh, focused on earthquake back projection. And so um, very briefly, uh, this is basically when you can use a seismic array such as the US array um, or the, the current array in Alaska to infer properties about the earthquake source. So you can infer, for, for example, rupture velocity or uh, is the, the source segmented on different uh, fault planes through time. Um, another part of Eric's work focuses on magmatic systems. Um, and so over the past couple of years, he's been involved in a large collaborative project looking at the um, magmatic system and the lithospheric structure under Mount St. Helens. Um, and so since joining the department, he's been busy deploying nodal array instruments um, throughout the Western US. Um, and many of these locations are again focused on magmatic systems. Um, and so these, these nodal seismometers are great because they're very portable. Uh, they enable really uh, dense networks that allow you to study a problem in detail and you can leave them out for approximately a month um, and collect a whole lot of data. Um, and so today he's gonna be talking to us um, about a particularly deep earthquake uh, in 2015 in the Bonin Islands and what we can learn from that. So uh, Eric, welcome and uh, take it away. All right, um, yeah, thanks Chris for that introduction. Um, so yeah, today as Chris mentioned, I'm going to talk about this earthquake that occurred um, at the Bonin subduction zone in 2015. Um, this has been on my to-do list to look at this event for five years since it occurred basically, um, but many things just kept getting in the way, but this past spring and summer, um, with the help of my collaborators here, uh, I finally found some time to sit down and look at this in, in some detail. So uh, these results are fairly new, uh, it hasn't been published yet, but um, I think we're all pretty excited about the results, so hopefully you'll find this interesting. So uh, the topic today uh, is deep earthquakes. Um, and as their name suggests, uh, they're distinguished by the depth at which they occur inside the earth. Um, so if you plot up the, the distribution of earthquakes for the entire earth um, as a function of depth, this is a, the type of plot you'll end up with. Um, so what you can see on this plot at the shallowest depths, that's where the seismicity rate peaks. This is where the largest and most destructive earthquakes that um, we're all aware of um, occur, but as you go to greater depths, earthquakes still occur. Um, they just occur at, at reduced rates. Um, so starting at about 60 or 70 kilometers depth, what you see is kind of this log decrease in the number of earthquakes as a function of depth. That decrease continues until about 350 kilometers, at which point things kind of flatten out and you have a little final bump in the seismicity rate within the transition zone of the earth. Um, and then things just terminate and they shut off right around the upper lower mantle boundary. So all of these events um, past kind of this peak starting at about 60 kilometers or so, we start to get this gradual decrease. These are what are known as, as deep earthquakes. Um, and deep earthquakes are important for, um, I guess, two primary reasons, scientifically important at least. Um, the first reason is that they're really useful for helping us understand what happens to a subducting slab um, as it descends into the mantle. Um, so for example, um, here's a global distribution of the all deep earthquakes around the world. Um, you can see most of them occur at subduction zones and we think most of them actually occur within subducting slabs. So if you can map out the distribution of deep earthquakes that can give you some insight into things like this bottom panel, which is showing the, the geometry of subducting slabs and the depths to which slabs subduct um, in the upper mantle. 
so that's one aspect of it. You can also look at more detailed aspects of the seismicity to constrain things like strain rates, um, at least relative strain rates, um, and even look at focal mechanisms and try to tease out um, the stress orientations within subducting plates. So um, that's one aspect why, why um, people look at deep earthquakes and why they've been studied in, in quite, a bit of, quite a bit of detail over the years. Uh, the other aspect of deep earthquakes um, that makes them scientifically interesting is that we don't really know why they occur. And the reason why we don't know why they occur is because um, they seem to um, be produced by mechanisms that are somehow different than the mechanisms that generate earthquakes um, in the shallow crust. So in the shallow crust, earthquakes are either generated by fracturing or failure, frictional failure along pre-existing faults. And in general, um, what you need for that process to occur are differential stresses of a similar magnitude as the confining pressure on the faults um, in the subsurface. So that's basically what's shown here in this right plot. Um, if you extrapolate the same, those relationships for the upper crust to the depth at which these deep earthquakes occur, um, you would need differential stresses to cause this type of failure um, on the order of several gigapascals. Um, so that's higher than what we think the differential stresses are actually in, inside the earth. Um, so that's a problem. The, the other problem with why deep earthquakes shouldn't occur, at least not by the processes that act near the surface, is because as you go to greater depths inside the earth and the temperature increases, um, the rheological behavior of uh, materials changes and instead of things deforming by a brittle processes where it's quite easy to um, focus um, strain um, and in particular focus strain rates and that's what you need to produce seismic waves um, instead of that process occurring that brittle process things tend to flow so it's much more difficult to actually generate the um, focused strain rates that you need to generate um, seismic waves so um, obviously the, a different mechanism needs to be operating at, at greater depths to produce, produce these deep earthquakes and several have been proposed over the years. Um, here's just a few examples of some of the more popular ones. Um, in the upcoming slides, I'm going to touch on in a bit more detail this transformational faulting of metastable olivine um, because this is the mechanism that's probably most relevant to this bone and islands earthquake that I'm going to talk about later on in the talk. So um, metastable olivine. Um, under ambient conditions inside the earth, um, you have a, a discontinuity at about 410 kilometers depth. And that discontinuity represents a phase change where olivine is transforming into spinel phases, Wadsleyite, and ringwoodite. So that's kind of under ambient conditions. Um, Inside a subducting slab, you have um, lower temperatures than the surrounding mantle. So what can develop within a subducting slab is that you have the pressure conditions that are necessary to um, cause this olivine to spinel phase change, um, but you don't have the temperature conditions. And this produces what's known as, as metastable olivine. Um, in this cartoon diagram here, that would be this kind of um, brown region, which has a wedge shape. Um, the wedge shape would, would come, at least in theory, from the, the fact that the slab warms up from the sides as the, the slab continues to subduct to greater and greater depths. So why is metastable olivine important? Um, it turns out if you take metastable olivine or um, maybe um, light materials, analogs to, to metastable olivine, and you put them in a lab, you put them under differential um, stresses, um, that are appropriate for these depths. Um, you generate failure in these samples, even at, at those high pressures, via faulting. And that faulting um, produces seismic waves. So basically in the lab, you can produce earthquakes with this material. Um, the actual mechanism by which this occurs is actually pretty similar to um, at shallow depths. So, um, you generate these kind of um, lensical, lens-like features um, known as anti-cracks. And inside these anti-cracks, you've undergone the phase change that you're looking for. So you went from metastable olivine to spinel. Um, 
these anti-cracks act just like mode one cracks would act at shallow depths. So they concentrate stress near the tips. And whenever you get a high enough density of these anti-cracks in a material, um, they can link up and they can generate a fault or a proto-fault, um, basically shearing between the anti-cracks. So that shearing's thought to occur um, both because of this focusing of stress near the tips, but also because the spinel material in the anti-cracks, it turns out it's really fine grain and it's really weak. So it actually allows the slip to occur um, across this proto-fault um, at these, these high confining pressures. So once you generate a proto-fault, that's what's shown here, you start to focus stresses near the end of that proto-fault that generates more anti-cracks. And so you can kind of grow a fault through time through this process. Now the, the final component of this that's important, and we'll come back to it later on in the talk, which is why I'm going into this in some detail, but um, this phase transition from um, metastable olivine to spinel, it's, it's exothermic. So as these um, anti-cracks form, they're actually locally increasing the temperature of the region, which should produce more anti-cracks. So you get into kind of this positive feedback thermal instability. And that's the reason why um, it's thought that this process of shearing um, doesn't occur just kind of as a slow process that wouldn't generate any seismic waves, but, but by a catastrophic, unstable process um, that will localize strain rates and produce seismic waves. So that's a key component. Um, so uh, this metastable olivine phase transformational faulting, um, it's been a popular mechanism for explaining deep focus earthquakes. As I said, most deep focus earthquakes occur within slabs. Um, it's difficult to know if they actually occur within this metastable olivine wedge, but um, for most studies, it's, it's kind of close enough or you just don't know. So it's not inconsistent with, with the idea at least. Um, but another big observation why this mechanism has had support is that as I mentioned before, the earthquakes inside the earth, they terminate. Um, we never, we don't observe earthquakes below the upper mantle, lower mantle boundary. Um, and the reason for that in terms of this metastable olivine mechanism is thought to be because that metastable olivine mechanism, whenever it goes from metastable olivine to spinel, it's exothermic. But once you get into the lower mantle and you're now changing to perovskite, mag magnesium leucite, um, that becomes endothermic. So you're then taking heat out of the system and dropping the temperature. So you're actually inhibiting the reaction you want to promote to generate the, the shear via this mechanism. So on this plot here, this is, um, I won't get into the details of this, but this is nucleation rate versus temperature. And so the exothermic reaction associated with olivine and spinel would be here. You increase the temperature, so you increase the nucleation rate of the new phase whereas the endothermic um, phase transition, say in the lower mantle, would be here. So you decrease the temperature and decrease the, the nucleation rate. So that's why it's thought that earthquakes um, terminate at, at this boundary. So with that bit of background, um, we can now go into the, the earthquake we're going to talk about today. This is the uh, 2015 magnitude 7.9 Bonin Islands. Um, deep focus earthquake. Um, deep focus is just a subcategory of deep earthquakes. But um, so this earthquake was extraordinary for uh, many reasons, actually. So first off, its magnitude, 7.9. Um, that's a large earthquake, no matter where it occurs. But for deep earthquakes, that's, that's extremely large. And in fact, this is maybe one of the top five um, deep earthquakes ever recorded, or at least deep focus earthquakes ever recorded. So it's unusual in that sense. Um, the next thing, it, it's depth. So it's depth actually was right there on that boundary between the upper and lower mantle, depending on what catalog you look at, it's somewhere between 664 and 682 kilometers depth. That's where the hypocenter was. Um, so a lot of, or the, some of the papers that have been written on this, this earthquake have actually debated what, whether it was in the upper mantle or kind of this forbidden region, the, the lower mantle. And there's actually been results to suggest both of those. So um, that issue hasn't been resolved yet. Um, the next point here, uh, which is a, a really interesting one, is that this earthquake was isolated from the background seismicity. 
So here's the, the earthquake and map view. Um, I should have said this earlier, but it, it occurs due to the subduction of the Pacific plate beneath the Philippine Sea plate. But if you take a cross section through this and then you plot background seismicity, which is what these dots are, you see that this deep earthquake occurred hundreds of kilometers away from the nearest um, earthquake that had occurred previously or the background seismicity. So um, it's um, kind of difficult to um, link these two together, at least just using seismicity. I'll show some tomography results in a second that will provide some insight to this. And then finally, uh, this earthquake was really unique um, because of the aftershock distribution where I'll, I'll show more of this later, but the aftershocks for this event, most of them were actually hundreds of kilometers away from where the, the hypocenter the main shock was. So this has never really been explained. Okay, so the location of the earthquake with respect to the background seismicity, you can actually um, gain more insight into this if you look at um, seismic tomography models, which map out high velocity regions, which are thought to be associated with subducting slabs. So if you look north um, of where this earthquake occurred and you take a cross section through the subduction zone, this is what most tomography models look like. So you have a westward um, kind of moderate dip and then this slab kind of flattens out as it goes into the transition zone and moves to the west. Whereas to the south, um, this is what the slab looks like. So you, you see a significant difference in the behavior. Now the slab has more of a vertical orientation and in fact, um, several studies have suggested that it actually overturns on itself. So it's actually been deflected um, back to the east um, in this region. In between these two slab behaviors, um, kind of unfortunately, this is where our earthquake occurred. So one interpretation of what's going on here is that in the south, you have this vertical dip to the slab and this eastward overturn. In the north, you have a more moderate dip to the slab and a flattening to the west. And in between, because those geometries change so quickly, um, several authors have argued you must have a slab tear or a highly deformed region within the slab. So because this earthquake occurred right where this tear would exist, um, we're either dealing with uh, an earthquake probably in the inner arc of this bend to the east or in an outer arc of this bend to the west, but it's kind of hard to to tell. Um, I'll, I'll kind of discuss both possibilities later on in the talk. Okay, so that, that was the perspective on this earthquake from the tomography um, side of things. Um, what we're going to do in this talk is actually study the rupture characteristics of the earthquake, um, as well as its aftershock sequence. Um, so the rupture characteristics, they can give you more of a fine very local but a very fine scale um, view of what's happening in the region of the earthquake. Um, so for example, the rupture characteristics should be dependent on say the local um, seismic velocity of wherever the earthquake occurred, or the, the local rheology of where the earthquake occurred. Um, they should also be dependent on say any fault systems that exist um, that the earthquake occurred on. So you can study the properties of the earthquake and maybe um, start to understand some of these fine scale details um, the other um, important thing about studying the earthquake properties is that they provide constraints for the various mechanisms that have been proposed for why these earthquakes occur in the first place. So the metastable olivine mechanism I, I mentioned before, for example, um, the observations we see in these sources should map, match uh, uh, to a certain degree the observations from the laboratory experiments. Um, so these are kind of the, the two main points of, of studying the rupture properties of deep earthquakes in general and this earthquake um, specifically. Um, and we're going to do this in two ways. So first we're going to study the rupture properties of the main shock, so this event here. Um, and we want to study those rupture properties because um, actually previous studies on those rupture properties have shown that um, they were pretty simple, that it was not a complicated rupture at all. It occurred on kind of one plane and it propagated in a single direction through time. Um, so we want to reevaluate that with um, maybe some, some new methods applied to the problem. And then the other way that we're going to study the source properties, um, as I mentioned before, the, the aftershock distribution for this event um, is really strange. So on this left panel here, this is the main shock. All these stars are the aftershocks. 
And you see, you just have a few down here by the, the hypocenter, the main shock, but then you have this huge cluster um, or large cluster um, up here within the background seismicity, hundreds of kilometers away from that main shock. So there's never been a, a really satisfying mechanism um, or detailed mechanism um, put forth for why that, that aftershock distribution is there. Okay, so um, the method we're going to use to study um, both the main shock and the aftershock sequence is known as back projection. Um, you've probably heard, or many of you have heard either myself or my um, PhD student, Hayan Kiho, talk about this method before, but I'll give a, a brief overview here. Um, so the basic idea of um, the back projection method is that if a earthquake occurs somewhere and you have a high quality seismic network to record the waves from that earthquake, um, so by high quality, I mean um, you have many stations and they're spread out over a, a large area. So if you, you have those conditions, what you can do is you can record the properties of the wave front from those seismic waves from the, the earthquake. And in particular, uh, the important properties of the wave front um, for, for this particular method um, are the first the orientation of the wave front, so basically the azimuth um, at which it is traveling, and then also the curvature of the wave front. And in reality, those properties are kind of hidden in the, the differential travel times between stations within this array. So um, for example, you get, you get different arrivals of this pulse of seismic energy, depending on where your location of your stations are within this array. But what that information is fundamentally telling you is this information about the wave front. So this curvature and this orientation of the wavefront, um, th that information or those properties, it's dependent on two things. It's dependent on the seismic velocity, or at least the first order. It's dependent on the seismic velocity of the earth and it's dependent on the source location um, that produced this wavefront. So we have a pretty good grasp on the seismic velocity of the earth. Um, so what we should be able to do is use that information, use the information that we record for the wavefront to um, determine where the source of the wavefront was. So the way we actually do that um, is that we basically time reverse the recorded seismic data at the seismic network back to the source region um, that we're interested in. And whenever um, we select the right source region, basically that, that energy will collapse on itself, um, indicating that this is the, the source of our wavefront. In terms of, of dealing with the data, what collapse actually means is that you go from this, this data that's offset in time based upon the location of the stations, whenever that's time reversed to the correct location, what you end up with is that energy within that wavefront all aligned at one particular time um, at that at the location to which you are um, time reversing your data to. So that time where everything's aligned is telling you the time when that, that energy was produced or the hypocentral time, to put it another way. So we can quickly evaluate if these waveforms are aligned at a particular time by stacking them to th uh, together or averaging, averaging them um, to produce a stack. And whenever they are aligned, you'll, you'll have a high amplitude stack like this. Whenever you consider a, a different location that isn't the correct location, kind of by the same token. Um, so let's say we consider a location over here. Whenever you try to collapse back the energy to that location, the waveforms won't be aligned. And whenever you stack them together, you'll have some kind of low amplitude um, diffuse stack that indicates that isn't the source of, of that particular wavefront. So that's the basic idea. Um, this can be used kind of in in two ways. Um, the most common way to use back projection is to actually track a rupture through time. Um, so for a large earthquake, um, a rupture can propagate over hundreds of kilometers. So you'll get a different wave front from the beginning of the rupture to the end of the rupture just because your source location changes. So one way that um, this method's used, the most common way is to track the source of energy of these really large ruptures um, as a function of time. And once again, that we can do that because the, the wave fronts are changing as the source location changes. The other way in which back projection can be used, um, kind of going back to a single source um, perspective here, but it's not used that often in this way, um, is to actually detect events that 
you didn't know were there in the first place. Um, so uh, the way this would work is if you have an earthquake, um, and let's say it's a really small earthquake, and so you propagate out a wave front, it's recorded at your seismic network. But because the earthquake was so small, the amplitude of those seismic waves are below the noise level of the data. Even if you took that data and collapsed it back to the source of that source of that energy, what you would see with that aligned data would look something like this. So this is data where the signal to noise ratio is, I think, 0.1. Um, so noise is 10 times the, the signal in this case. So there's nothing there. But the, the key step of actually averaging out this data once you've aligned it back to a, a, a particular location is really important for, for event detection because averaging out um, noise um, basically will reduce the amplitude of the noise if it's uncorrelated. Whereas if you, whenever you average out or stack the signal, the amplitude of that signal will be enhanced. So if you have enough of these traces that you've collapsed back to this particular location, which was the source of energy, you can actually bring out a signal that's just totally lost in, in the noise. Um, or to put it another way, you can detect earthquakes that, that people didn't know were there before. So uh, that's kind of an overview. Um, in, in the case of the Bonin um, Islands earthquake that we're going to study located here, we're really fortunate um, because we have the highest quality seismic array on Earth kind of right next door. So um, that's the high net array in Japan. It's shown with the triangles here. Um, it's at a at least a, a degree distance of about five to 15 degrees from the source. Um, and why that, that's really nice is because um, this basically allows us to have really high resolution image, uh, produce a high resolution image of the source that you couldn't get if your data was further away. Um, and to think about that um, in terms of maybe the geometry of ray paths leaving, leaving the source, if, for those familiar with this, basically the, the ray paths are leaving the source at a lot of different angles, so takeoff angles and a lot of different azimuths. And that spread in the ray paths that they leave the source allows you to constrain the location of the source really well when applying this back projection method. So in theory, um, we can not just track the lateral location of sources through time, we can also keep track of their depth and we have really good theoretical um, depth resolution using this array. However, there are complications associated with this. And uh, just to give you a, some insight into those complications, um, here is some data recorded at this high net array from um, a small earthquake here. It was a deep earthquake um, by Japan. Um, I don't know, this was several years ago, and this is a very small earthquake, so it's, it's not really notable. But the reason why I'm showing this is because this small earthquake actually produces very complicated waveforms um, recorded at the, the high net array. Um, so here's waveforms aligned on what should be the, the first arriving P waves. And you see kind of this main phase come in here. But you also see a lot of complexity. You, have, you see energy arriving before the main phase. You see quite a bit of energy arriving after the main phase. Um, and the reason why you have this energy um, arriving around this main phase and producing these complicated waveforms is that in the case of, of the high net array, you have a subduction zone there and you have a subducting slab. So whenever you have an earthquake within that subducting slab, energy from that um, earthquake tends to get trapped within the subducting slab, this high velocity feature that bounces back and forth. And then after it you know, rattles around in the slab for a while, it comes up to the surface. And so you constantly have this kind of focusing of energy within the slab that then goes up to the surface and that's what produces these complicated waveforms. Um, so we're kind of in a, a danger area here. Um, in seismology, typically what you want to do is you either want to study the source or the structure of the earth. And you try to select waveforms that allow you to focus on one one of those and, and try to avoid waveforms where you think you have effects from both. Well, we're, we're squarely in the, the realm of having effects from both whenever we're trying to study the source properties using waveforms that look like this. Um, so this specific problem is something my group has been thinking about for um, several years now. Um, and in particular, this has been the one of the main focuses of, of um, work from my PhD student, Hyung Kehoe, 
um, shown here. And he's developed a, a pretty elegant method for dealing with situations like this. And the, the basic idea or the fundamental idea behind the method that he's developed is that if you have a small earthquake um, in the subsurface that you want to image, that small earthquake should have small rupture properties. Um, so if you back project energy from that earthquake to that, to that location, you should be able to image that earthquake as a point source. Basically, that means that the, the source um, dimensions are smaller than the theoretical resolution of whatever array you're using. And so with that assumption, you can say, OK, any energy that isn't a point source is an artifact, because we know it's a small earthquake, so it has, shouldn't have large, um, a large rupture extent. And given that, we should feel free to select whatever data we want from our seismic array array such that that data images that small event as a point source. So that's, that's really it. That's the kind of fundamental idea that we are working with here. Um, we can select data to optimize the point source nature of earthquakes. Um, the way that's done is, is shown here. Um, I won't get into this, but basically Hai Young's incorporated data, this data selection um, into a genetic algorithm whereby which we can um, evaluate how well a seismic array images a small event as a point source, assign a fitness value to that array um, based upon that point source nature of the back projection result, um, um, uh, allow that, um, uh, that fitness value to determine the likelihood that that array will be selected for what's known as crossover and mutation steps. Um, to produce a new generation of seismic arrays. So that's the basic idea of what a genetic algorithm does. But um, what Hayim's done is incorporate that framework into a, a back projection approach. So does it work? Um, it turns out it works really well. Hayim's um, published a few papers on this. Um, I'm just showing results for this particular earthquake. Um, but what we've done here, so this is just showing how, how well it can improve source imaging. Um, in the top panel here, this is the back projection result for a magnitude 4.0 um, aftershock um, of this larger event that we're going to study. And what's being plotted here, this is depth and this is latitude, so this is a north-south cross section. And where you see warm collars, that's where you have high amplitude stacks and blue collars are low amplitude stacks. But what you see are kind of three pulses of energy here spread out over maybe 40 kilometers, which is an un unrealistic source image for a magnitude four earthquake, which should have maybe dimensions of a kilometer or so. So he, we use this earthquake in the genetic algorithm approach. This is showing how that fitness value increased as the number of generations in the algorithm um, proceeded. This is um, showing the distribution of stations that were ultimately selected from that genetic algorithm. So the red triangles are the stations selected, the white were thrown out. But the important part is um, whenever you run this event through the genetic algorithm, this is what you get out. This is the source image produced by this optimized array. And you can see it now has a much more impulsive, um, discrete um, source of energy, which we would expect for a small um, aftershock of this size. So we can use this seismic array um, that optimizes this point source um, to study the main shock as well as the aftershock sequence um, of this event. So just as a reminder, what we're going to do with this genetic algorithm-based back projection approach, we're going to study the source image, um, or the source properties of the 7.9 main shock. Um, we're going to look at um, the locations of earthquakes that have previously been sorry, the locations of aftershocks that have previously been um, reported in other earthquake catalogs, um, because um, the back projection approach can potentially um, locate those events a little better than, than, if, than their locations have been uh, previously. And then finally, the last stage of this, we're going to kind of go fishing and we're going to look for um, any undetected aftershocks of this sequence that, that haven't been found previously. And to do that, we're going to search over a really large volume um, and kind of back project continuously for about two and a half hours. So the first point there, um, the rupture properties of the 7.9 main shock. So um, I'm going to play you a movie of these rupture properties. Um, I'll just take you through these different panels before I play this. 
So the left panel here, this is a map view of the imaged energy. Um, you'll notice on, this, notice on this map view, this dashed line here, 8A prime, that's what's being shown in this, this middle panel. So this is a north-south north -south cross section through the imaged energy. So that will move as the inner imaged energy moves laterally. And then you have this other cross section, B to B prime, that's an east-west cross section. That's what's shown on the, the right panel. So um, just to give you a bit more here, uh, the warm collars, as I said before, that's where we have high amplitude stacks. So like the white areas are high amplitude stacks. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put dots at each time as this rupture progresses. And I'm going to put those dots at the centroid locations of the um, high amplitude imaged energy. So you can kind of track the rupture as it progresses through time. And speaking of time, uh, time's up here in the upper left-hand corner. I realize these got blurred out a little bit, so I apologize for that, but um, hopefully you'll get the, the gist of what's going on here. So I'll just play this movie. These were all played at the same time. So we are progressing through the, the, the rupture. What you can see from the map view result is that things initially propagate to the Northwest, they then jump back to the South, propagate to the west for kind of southwest for a few seconds and then you have another northwest propagation and then i am in the movie there because the image energy kind of goes away and things just turn into noise so let's play that movie one more time now we can focus on the middle panel what you'll see for this northwest propagation is that the depth of this energy doesn't really change much through time you have this jump back to the south that little segment that ruptures to the southwest um, you actually see pretty large um, depth extent to that. And then this final Northwest rupture, um, once again, not a, a ton of, of change in depth for that. Um, and then I'll just do it one more time for this, this right panel. So this would be the East-West cross section, um, but you'll see the, the same features here. Little change in depth for that first part of the image energy, a pretty significant change in depth here for the second part, and then a um, little change in energy for this last part of the Im imaged energy. And I should say, um, obviously there's some noise here. I'm, I'm normalizing the amplitude at each time step. So um, you don't have a continuous amplitude of energy throughout this whole process. Um, I'll show that here in a second, but that's, that's why sometimes the noise levels get kind of high. So we can summarize uh, these properties of the main shock um, in a single 3D figure here. So um, this is latitude, this is longitude, and this is depth. These are those centroid locations um, where the, the cubes are showing the locations and the collars of the cubes are showing the times at which those, those centroids were imaged. So from this kind of complicated looking um, set of centroid locations, we can kind of pull out some um, consistent features, I would say, um, or robust features. So uh, the first thing I'd like to point out is this dashed, oh, and I should say, um, what I'm doing with these planes is I'm just connecting the centroid locations to the base of the volume so that you can see the different segments easily. Um, this isn't implying anything about the orientation of the rupture itself, it's just so you can see the segments. But what we can see from this, um, first off, this hatched, hatched region, um, this region is where that energy jumped from the north to the south really fast. Um, and in fact, it's so fast, it's almost, um, at the P-wave velocities at, at these depths inside the Earth. So um, it takes some experience to, to recognize this, but whenever you see that, um, that jump in Im imaged energy in any back projection result, typically what that's indicating is that you are transitioning from the end of one source of energy to the beginning of a second source of energy, and that seems to be what's happening here too. So we kind of disregard that jump in imaged energy as just there's a transition time there that we're still tracking energy, but it's not a real feature of the rupture. So if you throw that out, basically what you're left with here are three segments of the rupture, and we define the segments based upon the direction of rupture. The first segment had a northwest orientation, the second segment had a, a southwest orientation and had a, a relatively large vertical extent to it, given how, how small it is. And then the third segment here, shown in red, has a um, it also has a northwest orientation. So in terms of dominant features of the rupture, it's by far this first segment. That's both in terms of 
has a very long length, so about 20 kilometers. But also, if you look at the actual amplitude, so it, as I said, I was normalizing everything before, but if you look at the relative amplitude between the different segments, the, the first segment by far has the highest amplitude, and the, the second and third segments have much lower amplitudes. Um, in terms of just length, um, as you saw, the first and third segments, so these northwest propagating ruptures, um, they have the, the largest length, so both around 20 kilometers. And then this second segment, the one in between, um, at which we're still propagating at kind of reasonable um, um, velocity, so we think this is a real feature. Um, this is almost perpendicular to the segments one and two, but it is a minor feature of the rupture. So how can we um, make sense of this um, kind of complicated set of centroids? Well, we can start by looking back at the focal mechanism of this event. So I, I showed the focal mechanism in a few different orientations before. So I showed it in map view, I showed it in profile view. And what you, hopefully, if you've seen focal mechanisms um, before or, um, or spent much time studying them, um, what you'll see here with this focal mechanism is you have four clearly defined quadrants to it. Um, so two compressional quadrants, two dilatational quadrants, and then two nodal planes separating um, those, those different quadrants. So whenever you have these clearly defined quadrants, this is what um, we call almost a perfect double couple. And whenever you have a perfect double couple, what that's indicating is that you didn't have a lot of complexity to your source in terms of the orientation of the, the fault plane on which the source occurred. So what that's telling us is that our source had to occur on one of these two nodal planes. Um, if it didn't, this wouldn't have this perfect double couple to it. So just to take you through uh, these nodal planes, once again, map view and profile view. So this is the uh, steeply dipping nodal plane in map view. This is the steeply dipping nodal plane in profile view. Um, to plot that kind of in a more um, geologic sense, I guess, this is what uh, this would look like. So it has a, um, let's see, southeast strike to it and it dips very steeply to the northwest. And then if you look at the other nodal plane, um, this is the, the symbol you would give to that. So it has a north, northeast strike to it and it dips to the south, um, southeast. So these points, if they occurred on these nodal planes, which we think they should given the, the perfect double couple here, um, they should basically agree with uh, one of two of these nodal planes. And we can test this. So we can just have a plane within our source region and we can say, how well did the, the points actually match up with that plane? However, whenever we do that, what we find is that, so you have your plane, you have your points, and we just measure the distance between those points and that plane. And we, we make sure the plane goes through the hypocenter of the event. Um, whenever you do that, you find pretty large distances for both nodal planes between um, the, the image points and the, the um, potential fault planes. So you're getting up to 10 kilometers here and 20 kilometers here. The red is for the near vertical nodal plane, the blue is for the sub horizontal plane. So this doesn't work. Um, and in fact, you can't fit a single plane to these points of any orientation. Um, so this is indicating to us either that you have multiple um, fault planes um, involved in this event, or you have a curved fault plane involved with this event. We can dismiss the curved fault plane um, hypothesis because if you had a curved fault plane, you wouldn't have a perfect double couple. So let's evaluate the, the perfect, um, the, the multiple fault plane hypothesis. Um, and we still have the constraint where those multiple fault planes have to agree with these nodal planes. Otherwise, you wouldn't have this perfect double couple. So what, the way we do this is we now have uh, these nodal planes of a certain orientation, but instead of applying them to all the points at once, we're going to apply them for each one of our three segments. And whenever we do that for the near vertical nodal plane, what we see is that there's really good agreement between the locations of centroids in segments one and three and this near vertical nodal plane um, below one kilometer difference between the two in, in most cases. Whereas for segment two, you, you, you don't have a, a great agreement. In contrast to that, if we look at the sub-horizontal nodal plane, that doesn't agree with any segment very well at all. Um, so we, we would infer that segments one and three um, 
actually are occurring on this near vertical nodal plane. Um, and they're, they're kind of on echelon or, or um, parallel to each other. So that leaves us segment two. Um, segment two is a minor feature, but it doesn't really um, fit either, either nodal plane very well. So um, what to do with segment two? We can't say definitively what, what the fault plane was on which this occurred, but if we make an assumption that the strike of this fault plane was the same as the strike of the other fault planes that we've inferred, what that would imply is that um, this vertical extent, this large vertical extent for segment two is actually imaging an uptip propagation um, on the fault plane on which the segment two occurred. Um, and basically it would, it would support the idea that if this has the same strike as these other um, fault planes and segment two occurred on a fault plane that is dipping to the northeast at an angle of 53 degrees. That's just a, a plane that would fit all of these points if you assume that strike direction. So you put those together, and this is the, the basic um, uh, fault system that comes out of that. So you have segment one, you have segment three, and then in between segment two, and you have a conjugate angle between those faults of 51 degrees. So I'm, yeah, Let's see if I can get through this talk. But, um, so where's this fit into the, the, the system, the, the slab system that I showed you earlier in the talk? Well, if you recall, um, in this slab system, you have um, a few different options, but um, for this particular explanation, I'm going to go with the, the option of a near vertical subducting plate, um, which overturns on itself and possibly deflects to the east. In that case, the event that we are imaging occurred in the inner arc of this deflection. Within that inner arc, you should focus um, compressional stresses, and in particular, you should um, basically rotate um, your sigma one direction um, slight, sorry, slightly away from vertical um, within that inner arc. So if this occurred in the inner arc and you have this um, orientation of sigma one, that basically um, agrees really well with the inferred fault system that we've come up with from our, our back projection points where you have this formation of conjugate faulting and the, the conjugate angle here and the orientation of the faults would suggest a sigma one orientation in the same as would be expected from a bend in the slab. So that's how we think that the conjugate faulting may tie in um, with the um, orientation of the slab. I should say if you had one to have a westward deflection, a similar argument works for the outer arc of the westward deflection, but I won't get into that uh, for this talk because I'm running out of time. Um, so that's the main shock. Uh, as I said, we'll also look, we also wanted to look at the aftershocks. Um, and first we'll look at the aftershocks that have been cataloged before. Um, so the aftershocks that have been cataloged before that at least occur close to the hypocenter of the event are shown here with this, this red square. So we're going to back project the seismic waves from those aftershocks and, and try to locate them a little better. Um, whenever we do that, um, these are those results that we get. So th these are from five of the aftershocks. There's a, an additional, additional one not shown here. But basically, um, I'm kind of compression the, compressing the back projection result here. So I'm plotting depth versus time. And we're basically integrating all the energy laterally. Um, so it's plotting at, at any, any lateral location, the maximum energy um, as a function of depth and time. So it's just a way to kind of compress everything into a, a 2D plot. But here's the image you get for uh, five of these um, aftershocks that occurred near the source. Um, what you see is that for four of these, um, well, let's say for three of them, you have a nice discrete pulse of energy with respect to depth and time. Um, for this one in the middle, um, we may actually have a doublet here, so we may have two earthquakes occurring um, very close to each other in both space and time. And then for this one um, aftershock that was reported by one catalog but not another catalog, this is the source image you get. And I just wanted to show this because this is the source image you would, ex you would see if you're trying to image a source of energy that doesn't exist, basically. So you see it's just a bunch of noise, like you just have multiple pulses of high amplitude in this plot. So actually for this aftershock that has been reported in one catalog, but not another catalog, we, we don't see any evidence for it. But anyways, um, 
whenever you locate the source of this energy on the same plot that um, I showed, or similar plot as I showed before, where these are uh, centroid locations from the main shot, um, shown with squares, and the dots are showing the locations of the aftershocks. And the collars now, since I don't care about time anymore, um, are showing depth, and you see it's a really narrow depth range, so from 660 to 665. Anyways, what you see is that these aftershocks are now located really close to the hypocenter for the most part, um, and in particular, they're, they're located close to this first rupture segment, segment one, um, that we've inferred from the main shot back projection results. This segment one had the highest amplitude to it, if you recall, so um, it kind of makes sense that it would produce the largest, um, let's say, Coulomb stress changes, if you want to think of it that way, that would generate aftershocks um, close to it. So we think these aftershocks near the source actually weren't as scattered as originally thought. They're actually very localized near um, this one segment. So uh, that's one aspect of aftershock detection. The other aspect um, we were going to do is this, this fishing expedition where we were just going to back project two and a half hours of energy back to a huge source region around this earthquake um, and see if we can find any aftershocks that have previously went undetected. And my motivation for this, the reason why I wanted to do it is because you have this weird reported distribution of aftershocks where you have some up here, you have some near the source that we just imaged, but nothing in between. And I just thought that doesn't seem right. I bet there's, there's some there. Um, it turns out I was, I was wrong, but I just see here in a second. So, um, the way we evaluate these results, because it's a huge amount of, of data or product, um, is that we plot the amplitude within our huge, our large um, back projection volume as a function of time. Um, whenever we do that, um, this is the result you get for that two and a half hours of, of back projection. So where you see peaks here, this is where you, we had a, a focused episode or a high, ap high amplitude episode of energy release. So these different peaks, we, we sort them out and we kind of set them aside as potential um, events uh, um, or a potential earthquake. Most of these were either events that were already detected or whenever we actually looked at the spatial distribution of energy, it was a mess. It was just scattered everywhere. So it was some kind of structural effect, um, not a, a discrete source of energy. However, there were uh, let's see, six peaks here, um, shown in red, where uh, we both met conditions of having a peak in imaged energy for the whole volume. And whenever we looked at the actual source image, it was a discrete um, kind of point-like source of, of energy. So whenever we looked at the locations of these events, um, we, uh, well, first off, here's the, the different results. So this is depth and time again. So I'm kind of, once again, compressing the back projection results. But whenever we actually looked at the, the locations of these, we had quite a, a surprise. Um, we didn't see these events, you know, connecting one aftershock group to the other aftershock group. And in fact, we only saw one event above the main shock, which is shown here with E, which kind of has a complicated signal to it, but um, it seems, seems to be real. Most of these events actually occurred below the main shock. Um, so look at the depths of where you see these, these really warm collars. So um, below 690 kilometers here, I'll just fast forward to the bottom one here, um, down below 750 kilometers. So uh, I kind of doubted this at first, but then I went and looked at the raw data and it turns out the raw data is pretty messy, as you would, you would expect, but whenever you align the raw data um, based upon the predicted arrival times of P waves from this location at this time, you actually do see a, a, a phase arrival. So this is high frequency data. This is really noisy. Um, as I showed before, um, you can stack out a signal even if you can't see the signal in the raw data, but hopefully you can see this thing right here. That is what is stacking. It's very low amplitude. Um, but where you can see the effects of these, these earthquakes or the, the result of these earthquakes in um, a little clearer is if you band pass the data to lower frequencies. So this isn't the frequency range we used um, in the back projection analysis. 
but it is a frequency range where once again we've aligned data on the predicted arrival times and hopefully you can see kind of this vertical feature here which is the phase arrival so you see this for all of these deep earthquakes um there uh i'm getting a little late here but there is no um evidence of this being a structural effect so what i mean by that is that what you can have is an earthquake occurring somewhere else those seismic waves interacting with some kind of structural feature, say in the lower mantle in this case, and then those waves that are either converted or scattered arrive at our seismic array. And so you could um, potentially image those scattered waves as a source of energy, even though that wasn't an earthquake. Um, that doesn't, th there's no way that's happening here. Um, so whenever you look at the earthquake catalogs around the world, there's no earthquakes even remotely close in terms of time to that would generate that mechanism. So we think these are real events. Um, and just to tie this in with um, the beginning of the talk, um, you have this upper and lower mantle boundary, which in this region occurs somewhere between 690 and 700 kilometers depth. We think a lot of these events are, they're, they're well located, they're below this depth. So we think these are the first observations of earthquakes um, that initiate in the lower mantle that we're seeing. To tie that back to the phase transformational, when I was rambling on about this, this uh, metastable evolving mechanism before, um, as I mentioned, once you get into the lower mantle, that, that metastable evolving mechanism shouldn't work because it becomes endothermic. So there's a, a problem here um, where it seems like these really deep events are completely incompatible with this metastable olivine phase transformational uh, mechanism. So we can also gain some insight in these, these really deep events um, based upon their locations with respect to velocity models of the region. So as I said, um, we have two sets of, of events here. We have, or two sets of aftershocks. We have aftershocks close to the hypocenter. Those aren't particularly interesting, but then we have these aftershocks that occur mostly at really deep depths. Um, so if you combine those aftershocks, which are very far away from the hypocenter, with the aftershocks that were previously reported at shallow depths that I pointed out, and you compare that to what we know or what we think we know about the, the subducting slab in this region, um, those two sets of events plot down here for the events we detected and up here for the previously detected events. And this is um, another velocity model that I didn't show before but you can see this, this eastward deflection um, in this velocity model. So how do we interpret this? You have, you have events near um, the top, uh, I'll go back to this. So you have events up here, kind of in the transition zone, you have events down here um, uh, within the, the lower mantle. Recall that I, I said that up here, you have a slab tear where the geometry of the slab is changing. Um, so in this cartoon, that slab tear is kind of represented here by a thinning of the slab. Um, and then you have aftershocks down here at the bottom of the slab as it impinges on the, the lower mantle. So the, the hypothesis we've developed here is that these distal earthquakes that focus in the slab tear and at the bottom of the slab are actually telling us that once you had failure within this inner arc of the subducting slab, what that would do is it would remove a lot of um, resisting stress just caused by, um, I guess, elasticity. Um, once you remove that resisting stress, um, the slab itself would be free to settle or gravitationally sink to a small degree, but um, to some degree. So you've, resi you've removed resistance within an inner arc, the slab settles, at the up dip extent of this settling slab, you have these aftershocks, which are at really shallow depths. And at the down dip extent of the settling slab, you have aftershocks, which are in the lower mantle. Um, and this is just due to a slab settling stress perturbation. So that's the, um, the basic idea. So this just says that slab settling has been proposed before, but um, I've went right up to the hour. So I'll just put up my summary slide and uh, take any questions. Thanks. Hey, thank you, Erica. Unfortunately, since I have my um, headphones on, the applause button is not going to work out. So you, you can just imagine the 
the uh, rapturous applause from the audience. So thanks for your talk. Um, so I'll moderate questions here. We have a, a couple minutes for questions. And uh, if you have a question, you may raise your hand in the participants list and I can uh, call upon you to ask your question or you can just type your question in the chat box and uh, I can uh, relay the question to Eric. Hi, Eric, I really enjoyed your talk. So I'm wondering if, um, you know, you could do something like that in the end is to see, to test whether or not the slab penetrates into the lower mantle, since this is such a, you know, like, as you know, there, there are people suggesting that and people think, depending on where you are, obviously, along the subducting, um, subduction zone, you know, there are places where it seems like it's penetrating, others it's not penetrating. So have you thought of using this method to test whether or not you have penetration there? Um, yeah, that's a, a good question, Barbara. Um, so I think that's, that's going to be the focus of future work is um, searching out kind of these really deep earthquakes that can give us some insight into what the slab's actually doing in the, the lower mantle, um, both uh, directly following a large event, um, as well as potentially they just occur all the time. It would be great if I, I was actually wrong about this being kind of a, a triggering um, type process where um, some aspect of the main shock actually trigger these deeper events. If they're just some part of the background seismicity, that would be pretty insightful. Um, with regard to your question on the Andes, so yeah, this is um, um, Daniel Portner's velocity model um, from a part of the Andes. And yeah, as you were mentioning, it seems like in certain regions you have the slab actually going down into the lower mantle. Um, this particular cross section is um, through the, the Bolivian earthquake that occurred into, in 1994. Um, this is something Susan Beck um, an event that Susan Beck knows a lot about. But with this event also, um, you kind of had a similar signal um, in terms of the aftershock sequence. So after the large event, you had aftershocks close to that large event, but you also had um, some shallower events pop up up here in this, this group of seismicity. So um, if I could just go back in time and deploy a seismic array of you know, anywhere, uh, this would be, you know, maybe one of those spots because, yeah, I think there would be some potential indication of um, what happens to the slab at greater depth from the, the aftershock sequence and potentially lower mantle seismicity here, just because it's a, it seems like a, a similar setting, at least in terms of the slab geometry and the, the gaps between seismicity. So, um, but it's not, it's not too late. There's, there's lots of earthquakes like this that we can look at. And I know data coverage in South America has, you know, improved since this Bolivian earthquake. So, um, yeah, it's potentially something we can look at, at least in certain regions along that subduction zone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Pete DeSells had his, raise, has his hand raised, but uh, I just want to point that Roy has made a comment on the chat that says, not a question, but a comment. Eric, your group is using really innovative ways to really dig into the earthquake process. Great work. Uh, and so Pete, Thanks, if you have a question, go for it. Maybe not. Hi, Eric. Hi. Yeah. I had a question, but Barbara already asked it. Um, but I can come up with another one. <laughs> it's really a fantastic talk. I, I love these seismology talks in which you're able to tease out the details of what's actually happening at a sort of structural level. It's really cool. Um, I guess I'm just wondering uh, if anybody else is doing this kind of work at this level of detail and if there's any kind of um, a consensus developing about patterns in these kinds of things um, because there are lots of tearing slabs and, and recurving slabs and so forth. Are there other indications out there that this kind of uh, reconstruction can be done? Um, or is it just something that you guys are doing and you've got a corner on the market? Well, I, yeah, I, I don't know if I'd say that. Like there's a lot of yeah, smart seismologists out there. I would say we, we have a, we're in a, a good position in terms of we have, you know, a, a uh, a grant doing this exact thing. Um, I have a, you know, um, 
<clears throat> fourth year PhD student who developed this method for um, actually using this local data. That's the key. You have to be able to use the local data and mo most groups shy away from, from that because of the, the complex waveforms that I was talking about. So what Hai Young is going to do is basically this for the Izubonin, Japan and Kurao subduction zones. And he's going to do it for every earthquake um, magnitude six and above. So that's hundreds of earthquakes. So this is um, small potatoes basically um, compared to what hopefully he'll finish by the time he's done with his PhD. Asi, do you have a question? Go for it. Yeah, I just have a pretty simple question, but how often, and do you think this would happen with shallower earthquakes? How often do you think there's this confusion between seeing a moment tensor that is non-double couple? Uh, well, it should be non-double couple sort of in a way. Um, I'm not phrasing that properly, but basically it's a complex event with multiple rupture planes, but it's confused as a perfect double couple, the better way. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a, a good question. The, the advantage of shallower events uh, in a lot of cases is that um, there are mapped faults. So, uh, you know, you sometimes know the orientation of faults. I, I know like with Ridgecrest, which I think is something you think about, um, we didn't necessarily know the orientation of all those faults, but um, in general, you have a much better sense of the fault system at, you know, in the, in the uh, transition zone, we really don't know. Um, we have no geologic evidence, obviously. Um, and then the other important thing is the aftershock sequences. So typically for shallow events, um, you have a really dense distribution and a really um, vigorous aftershock sequence. And those aftershock sequences can um, show you the orientations of faults that potentially fell during the, the main shock, though that can be misleading, obviously. For deep earthquakes, this is one of the weird things about them. Um, at least near the, the hypocenters, they typically don't have very many aftershocks. So what I showed you here with like five aftershocks, that's pretty typical even for very large events. So um, I do think that you're right, like uh, very simple events, especially when they're not in, they don't, when they occur in regions that aren't instrumented particularly well, um, they're not actually that simple. I, I imagine you get more at, like on echelon faulting during the rupture process than um, people know right now, um, but you do have a, a better sense of, you know, at least the, the potential fault orientations that could have been, uh, could have failed during the main shock. And that gives you the ability to potentially model the seismic waves from the main shock by incorporating that information. Um, so to a lesser degree, I guess I would say, but yeah, it's still very much possible. This was really cool, thanks. Thanks. Uh, Eric, we have a question from the chat, and I think this will probably be the last question uh, that we have time for before we take a short break. And then uh, I'm going to hand it over to Marcus to conduct uh, the colloquium discussion class. Uh, but the question is from uh, Susan Beck, and what are the implications for the transformational faulting mechanism? Um, well, I, yeah, so. Uh, I guess there's one or one of two possibilities. Um, either it doesn't act for these really deep events, um, lower mantle seismicity, um, and something else is is going on there. So there's there's other mechanisms like thermal shear instabilities and things like that that potentially um, are the source of these these deeper events. Um, the other possibility that I've thought about is that this kick supplied by the settling of the slab um, causes some, let's say there's some slab fragment down there that has some metastable oil being still in it. And you just get a densification of the, uh, the uh, anti-cracks all of a sudden whenever you get the stress kick. Um, that would still be endothermic, but you would have this stress perturbation. So um, what we would need to do to test that, I think, is to actually look at the waveforms from this event 
um, especially like the 750 kilometer event and see does does that event have a perfect double couple or do you actually have some kind of volumetric source to it or some kind of really complex source to it that may give you some insight into whether um, kind of a, a random distribution of anti-cracks could all emerge in some kind of weird could all merge in some weird orientation to produce the the seismic waves or do you still just have this kind of simple shearing that we see for a, the other deep earthquakes in which case um, I don't think it can be transformational faulting in that case, um, at least not of metastable olivine. Did that make sense, Susan? Yeah, that was a great answer, Eric. And it was a great talk. Thanks again, Eric. Great talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks,